But even those low birth weight pigs, aside from survival, there's also literature that suggests that these low birth weight pigs have slower average daily gain to market weight. They might have decre decreased muscle mass, uh, lower um, muscle growth. And if we think about the gilts, there's a large data set out of Brazil that suggests that if gilts are less than one kilo at birth, they're gonna have compromised lifetime reproductive performance. Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, where we explore the science behind swine nutrition. I'm your host, Jorge Estrada. And today in our podcast, we have Dr. Lee Johnston, who is a professor currently uh, at the University of Minnesota in Animal Sciences. Today, we'll be discussing how nutrition influences fetal programming and postnatal performance of pigs. So, Dr. Johnson, it's a pleasure to have you here. Welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks for the invitation. I always enjoy visiting with you folks and uh, trying to share some information we've learned, and hopefully it's helpful to someone else. Excellent. Well, with that being said, since you have been with us before, uh, we'll skip a little bit on the background, but how about we start talking about uh, fetal programming? I mean, why don't you tell us a little bit what is that about? Well, fetal programming, if we go by the, the, the book definition, it's the physiological setting by an early stimulus or insult at a sensitive period that results in long-term consequences for function. So that's a pretty highfalutin uh, definition. But basically, it's things that are happening to the pig in utero nutritionally, uh, maybe environmental stress, maybe a health challenge that is setting the stage for that pig's performance after birth throughout life. So if you think about it, um, you're setting the stage for a pig to be either very productive or maybe compromised and not have the ability to, to uh, fulfill its full genetic potential. Um, I think about this when I started in swine nutrition and graduate school and so forth, got to Minnesota, the discussion was, well, if we have finishing pigs and we can get them a couple pounds heavier out of the nursery into finishing, that means two, three days less to get to market weight. So we need to think about nursery nutrition as it affects grow finish performance. Well, then people started talking about, well, we can get better nursery performance if we wean a heavier pig. So they move back into the lactation period to say, what can we do to set the pig up for good performance in the nursery and then on to finishing and so forth? And this to me is just the next logical step of going back one more phase, going into gestation and saying, what can we do nutritionally that might influence the pig and set them up for good lifetime performance. So to me, it's very exciting thinking that we're feeding the sow, but we're feeding 12 or 14 or 16 little pigs inside. So one um, nutritional intervention is influencing 16 progeny. Totally. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a fascinating topic and very hard to, you know, um, I guess there are ways to influence that, that and you're going to help us today to understand that. So um, let's talk a little bit. I mean, you, you gave us a little bit going on, on, you know, why are we or why are you um, trying to understand better these uh, effects, right, from the nutritional standpoint. So let's talk a little bit of, you know, that fetal programming, you know, how does it affect the performance of the animal? Let's just start there. Well, basically, one of the things that we've looked at, and most researchers to this point have looked at pretty heavily, is birth weight. And I, we don't have to tell producers that if you have a very low birth weight pig, they struggle, they may not survive. And there's been several data sets around the world that has shown that if a pig is born at one kilo or less, 2.2 pounds or less, their mortality rate goes through the roof. So as birth weight goes down, mortality goes up. But as you get below one kilo, 
it really skyrockets. And that mortality of those pigs less than one kilo of birth weight, it can be upwards of 80 to 100 percent. And so that's a, kind of a beginning stage of birth weight affecting just survival of the pig. Um, and, and here we need to think a little bit about low birth weight pigs that are just small for gestational age or interuterine growth retarded pigs, IUGR pigs, and they're a little bit different. The IUGR pigs are those ones that are, some farms call them squeakers. They're the little dolphin head. They got the wrinkles around the nose and the eyes. Those pigs have been disadvantaged in utero in that they didn't get enough nutrients. And basically the nutrients they did get, they put towards vital organs like the brain and the liver, and the rest of the body didn't quite a, kind of grow to match it. So that's why they look like they got that bulging head. And we know that those survival, those pigs aren't good. But even those low birth weight pigs, aside from survival, there's also literature that suggests that these low birth weight pigs have slower average daily gain to market weight. They might have decre decreased muscle mass, uh, lower um, muscle growth. And if we think about the gilts, there's a large data set out of Brazil that suggests that if gilts are less than one kilo at birth, they're going to have compromised lifetime reproductive performance. So those pigs that are less than one kilo at birth, those gilts produced about 11% less lifetime, 11% fewer pigs over her lifetime compared to gilts that were uh, normal birth weight. And those very low birth weight gilts had a 45% reduction in herd days or life in the herd. And most of that came previous to the first mating. But um, so something that happens in utero is affecting the performance of that female out, you know, multiple parities. So um, I think it's, it's important that we think about what's happening in gestation and how we might be able to set up the pig for good performance throughout life. Oh, that's a, that's a, a great challenge. And, and again, you know, part of the, let's say, you know, as, as an industry, we are producing a lot of, a lot of pigs out of a single sow, right? So, uh, and one of the challenges is being specifically what you mentioned earlier, how can we increase the, the, the birth weight of those piglets? And, and it's been very hard to do, right? I mean, a lot of people, uh, have tried to to influence that, and it's, it's something very hard to change. So, with that in mind, why don't you tell us a little bit? You know, you have been working with with zinc. Um, what is the role that that zinc plays in in fetal programming and and postnatal peak performance? Then, well, I'd like to be able to tell you exactly what the role of zinc is in in that whole physiologic process, and we don't know exactly. We know that. Um, if we feed high zinc, and the studies vary a little bit, but high zinc being somewhere around 600 ppm of zinc, uh, maybe up to 800 ppm, if we feed it from late gestation, say day 80 of gestation on through farrowing, we can improve the survival of pigs, low birth weight pigs in particular, so those one kilo uh, size pigs. We can improve their birth weight. In our study, we got 10 percentage units better survival with the high zinc. There are other groups that have, um, and then we did a second study where we fed zinc about 350 parts per million of zinc. Instead of starting at day 80, we fed it the whole way through gestation. And in that study, we did not increase the, the uh, postnatal survival of pigs but we did increase the percentage of pigs born live when we fed that high zinc. Um, we reported our work in about 2019, our first study that uh, Dr. Julia Holland did. Um, and when that data came out, we think we spurred some discussion amongst other groups in the world. And in 2022 or 2023, uh, the Brazilian group, um, the Coney paper, working with PIC, they replicated our work and they provided 850 parts per million of zinc 
from day 80 of gestation to farrowing or throughout the whole gestation. And they saw the same improvement in pre, uh, pre-weaned survival. They saw uh, a quicker performance to market. So pigs were about eight pounds heavier at market weight. And the important thing that they saw that we didn't measure is they saw heavier placenta. And in, in a discussion with the researchers at a conference recently, she also told me that the, the density of uh, blood vessels in the placenta was greater in the zinc-fed pigs compared with the control. So, uh, and that's a theory we had, and we're going to measure that in a coming study, that zinc, in, for some reason, is increasing placental function, improving placental function, making pigs more robust, so they survive better after, after farrowing. We've found six recent studies in the literature that fed high zinc, and all six of them, um, some showed benefits in birth weight, some showed benefits in um, pre-wean survival. Uh, none of them showed any negative effects of high zinc. So that is encouraging to us. The negative effects of high zinc that we need to consider is what's the environmental impacts. Because when we feed this high zinc, sows are excreting more zinc and we're doing some LCA work and showing that there's an improvement in some other environmental parameters because you're weaning more pigs. And so still things we need to work out, but it's promising. Wisenetics turns podcast airtime into brand authority. We don't sell ads, we elevate voices. Curious how far your voice can go to become a reference in the industry and attract more leads? Scan the QR code and discover how we can turn your expertise into unmatched brand authority. Let's transform expertise into influence, starting now. Well, I mean, as you're saying, if, if the consistency is there in a sense that it's uh, usually a positive result, that's, that's quite fascinating. I guess there are a lot of question, questions around what is the source of the sink, what is the dose, as you were saying. I mean, I'm assuming there are a lot of unknowns still that we need to understand, right? For sure. And um, I've talked to some of my researcher friends who are sow enthusiasts, and we commiserated about how hard sow trials are to do and how long they take and how expensive. And, and um, so, yeah, the source question comes up all the time. We have used zinc sulfate in all our work. Uh, the Brazilians use zinc oxide and saw a very similar response, so that's encouraging. We have not gone down the road of a chelated uh, zinc or uh, organic zinc that could help maybe mitigate some of the environmental concerns. The timing, um, if we could drill down, uh, fine-tune the timing, that might help reduce the excretion. We just uh, had a student finish a project, a very large project, where he fed high zinc up until from mating up until day 40 or from day 80 to farrowing or during both those periods. And uh, we had uh, about 800 sows on that trial. And so he's wading through the data and hopefully we'll have some answers that maybe there's some times early and late that we can put it in and not put it in, mid in high levels in mid gestation to help mitigate some of the environmental uh, excretion problems, but still gain the benefits of better pig performance. So uh, stay tuned, I guess, for a future Black Belt podcast. Awesome, exactly. So, and, and again, you know, I mean, uh, it seems that it's something very promising and, and might open the door for another interventions, right, in the future, as, as, as you were saying earlier. So unfortunately, that's all the time that we have today. So. Dr. Johnston, we really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks for the opportunity and uh, look forward to future discussions. Yes, sir. So, everyone, thanks for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us some comments and join us in our next episode.